Thank you for joining Silence today. Our webinar topic is Squashing Emotet, Responding to 2018's Most Active Threat. The threat landscape is changing once again, and the past couple of months have seen the resurrection and resurgence of a familiar threat, Emotet. And we have Sig Murphy joining us today. And before he starts, I just want to give a quick housekeeping note that uh, if you have any questions, please submit them at the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. And Sig, are you ready to begin? I am, thank you, Shirley. So thank you all very much for, for joining us today to talk about uh, a really, really advanced uh, threat out here that we're seeing a lot of called Emotet. So I am the consulting director for North America for Silence's services team. And in that role, I oversee all of our uh, proactive uh, engagements. These are engagements that we utilize to help our clients avoid getting breached and also our reactive or incident response or incident containment engagements. So, uh, in so in so doing, <coughs> our team has about <coughs> excuse me, um, our team has about um, 40 to 60 incident responses going on at any given time throughout the world. We do have uh, different teams throughout um, throughout the world that respond to cybersecurity incidents, and so we have a a fair picture of kind of the, the threats that are facing um, new clients and existing clients. And really, uh, in the last few months, we've seen a, a rapid resurgence of Emotet, which is a type of malware. Um, and it, it's changed quite a bit. It's evolved. And the group behind it is a group that is uh, really well organized. And they're, they're a pretty tough adversary. Um, they're, they're pretty smart. And they've done a lot of um, kind of research and development, which we'll see shortly. But a uh, key takeaway here is that because of the way Emotet is programmed by these attackers, uh, the, the uh, threat, and if you if an organization that's you know, mid to large size organization has an infection um, through Emotet, there, oftentimes that can cost over a million dollars per incident to effectively combat. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which we'll get into a little bit later in, in the talk. Um, so real quick, I have some uh, safe harbor statement that, that you can review, but it basically says that um, what we're talking about today is, has been developed by Silence. And uh, I, I really appreciate each and every one of you uh, joining us today. I hope that um, I will be of some service here in defining this threat how it's evolving and how to combat it. So real quickly about, about me, I am um, Sig Murphy, as, as uh, Shirley mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, and um, currently um, have the responsibilities that I outlined for, for Silence's professional services team. Previous to joining Silence, I spent about 12 years at the DOD Cyber Crime Center as a, as a defense contractor. And I uh, had the role there of uh, basically developing out the intrusion team for that agency. And our team uh, was really at the forefront of the initial response by the US government uh, to combat what is commonly now called advanced persistent threats. So in, in that role, I, I, our team uh, had a pretty unique vantage point to observe the threats that were impacting the different the different DOD services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and started noticing some commonalities amongst uh, the threats that were um, that were hitting the services back in, I think it was 2001, and uh, really raised the, the flag for the rest of the, the DOD and the US government uh, that we thought this was a concerted effort by uh, nation states. And uh, we had some great advocacy from our executive uh, at that that organization that uh, took that forward and ran with it, and uh, it was it was an interesting uh, interesting time. Initially, a lot of the other government agencies didn't want to believe that that our our adversaries could be advanced enough to where they could do a, con a concerted attack. Um, but we now all know through um, through the news and life experience and, um, and what we know today that that there are multiple 
governments out there that are sponsoring these very highly sophisticated groups of cyber attackers. Uh, in 2006, 2007, I, I transitioned into, I, I kept my day job at the DOD, but I transitioned into doing commercial incident response as the, the investigative lead for a number of commercial cyber incidents. Um, can't talk about 99.9 .9 of them, but percent of them, but um, there's a few that I can talk about. One of them is the TJX intrusion, which is public knowledge. And um, the reason I can talk about it is because the attacker during his, um, I guess, examination at court, the uh, the, the kind of gang leader there that was behind the group that carried out the attack, uh, you know, called called my team out as kind of a Scooby-Doo moment of if, if it wasn't for those darn kids, uh, I would have gotten away with it. So that that relationship is public. Uh, you know, we worked hand in hand with law enforcement on that and most matters uh, to to address them. Um, I've continued to work through um, leading major cybersecurity incidents, and I've been uh, thrilled uh, here. My time at Silence really um, kind of getting getting our team out at, at the forefront of the current threats and responding in in a quick and effective way. So. I think most of you, having received the uh, the invite, know about Silence. So, real quick, uh, Silence is an artificial intelligence company. Uh, we are best known for our cybersecurity software, such as Silence Protect, which is an antivirus killer. Uh, it basically uh, is a replacement that utilizes AI and machine learning to be much more effective than traditional antivirus. Um, and then we also have a, a product, which is a, a forensic detection or response tool called, called uh, Silence Optics. And uh, that really greatly enhances uh, our team's capabilities to respond to threats. Um, with that, let's go ahead and, uh, and jump in here. So today I'm going to talk about Emotet and the threat that it presents. Um, and talk about briefly how it's evolved and how it spreads and why it's such a problem. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, how to combat that and kind of some of the characteristics that, um, that make it kind of tough to combat. Uh, why it's, it's, uh, it's such a challenge for incident responders and for organizations out there to effectively deal with it. And then uh, lastly, I'm gonna talk about how to prevent becoming a victim of cyber attacks like Emotet. So Emotet is a family of malware that is um, targeting Windows systems, and it is in, it basically introduced into victim environments via malicious spam mail. So these are generally messages that are, are um, initially targeted by this attack group uh, to target specific verticals, and then uh, set up to auto-spread to other uh, individuals that, that um, basically have their credentials found or harvested on victim machines. Um, it, it is Windows only because of the way that it was designed as, as an executable, of course, and also because it was designed to spread via SMB and uh, specifically targeting uh, Windows Microsoft domain credentials. Um, it's, it's a pretty nasty little bug. Uh, we'll talk about it in depth here in a few slides. But uh, it, it does present some unique challenges because of the way it was written by the attack group. And the, the timeline of, uh, of Emotet and how it emerged is rather interesting as well. So we'll spend a few slides talking about that. And uh, you'll see hopefully by the end of this timeline that um, there were some pretty deliberate decisions made by the attack group and testing and QA that's made it kind of the, the current uh, threat that it is today, which is just making it tough. So the first versions of Emotet were observed in the wild in June of 2014. And these were uh, specifically targeted to the German and Austrian banking industries. So the malware uh, itself is designed uh, to have two, two phases or two, two pieces to it. The first piece is a spreader slash loader piece. Um, that it, its sole job is to uh, is to spread throughout an environment and infect systems with the payload. And that second piece is that payload. Initially in 2014, 
the uh, payload that was utilized uh, for this type of malware was custom designed by the, the group that was making it. And so we had, uh, we had the both pieces designed by that group. And the goal of the malware was to spread to victim systems and to harvest uh, credentials and to uh, upload those credentials to the attackers. The specific goal uh, from the beginning was to harvest credentials that could be utilized for banking solutions. So um, both individual banking uh, applications, such as you know, like a like a Bank of America or Bank of Germany type uh, login, as well as institutional um, credentials that can be utilized to transfer money. So from June until December of 2014, Emotet ran ragged throughout the, these two uh, banking verticals. And then in 2014, almost as if somebody flipped an off switch, click, it stopped spreading. And this was very notable to the cybersecurity community as a whole, because generally speaking, um, this type of infection that's set up to automatically spread, or you know, we say it has worm-like capabilities, um, generally, uh, they, they continue to go uh, throughout, spread wide, and basically uh, go until uh, they're effectively countered by technology, such as antivirus or other technologies. Um, but in this case, uh, they, they, the systems, it just kind of stopped. And so that was, that was interesting. The cybersecurity industry uh, did a pretty thorough job of reverse engineering the malware samples that were available. And uh, there was some, some anti-RE, anti-reverse engineering capabilities built into it. It was a somewhat advanced uh, set of malware samples. Um, but through, throughout analysis and, and some pretty dedicated research, the, the community started seeing um, some hallmarks of, of programming techniques, and they started dubbing the group that was behind this Mealybug. And Mealybug has been the name that stuck with them through present day. So uh, we have another six months that goes by with pretty much very low activity for, for Emotet. And then in June of 2015, uh, it activates again uh, with with inbound targeted emails that were uh, basically specifically crafted by this this group, Millibug, and uh, it, it targets some old friends in the German and Austrian banking industry again. Uh, some more uh, wider tech, uh, wider targets in the the greater German and Austrian financial industries as a whole, and then also the Swiss banking industry. And again, uh, with a couple of modifications, it, it runs pretty rampant through those, uh, those industries. Even though they had been hit previously, um, the, uh, the group behind the, the malware started uh, adding features to it like polymorphism, which makes it harder for the endpoints to, uh, you know, antivirus, traditional antivirus to effectively combat them. And so from June until December, look familiar, uh, June 2015 through December 2015, uh, Emotet runs rampant, stealing credentials, and uh, there are widespread reports of those credentials being utilized to effectuate financial gains by the attackers. Um, then in December 2015, it goes silent again. So again, a, a, a switch is flipped and uh, it pretty much um, stops spreading. So this uh, was uh, interesting as well. Um, it stays dormant until early April of 2017, last year. And then it reappears um, with some additional uh, modifications to the code that made it even more, um, I guess, challenging to uh, detect and combat with traditional antivirus. And then also, for the first time, we see samples that are in the minority, but, but still out there, of the loader piece of Emotet being utilized to drop other payloads, such as Drydex and Geodo, uh, which was uh, interesting because uh, it, it was almost like just some early warning signs that, that this very virulent uh, spread, mo spread module could be utilized to uh, spread other, other types of malware. And this time, rather than, than uh, hitting the same targets, they um, they hit the UK banking industry very hard. And we were getting uh, calls from new clients and all over the UK 
looking for help with with this type of uh, type of infection. And later that month, um, the we see targeted emails that are then uh, launched against the U.S. financial regulation uh, environment, so financial regulatory bodies, uh, in particular the FSLTT, which is a, a regulator that has a very specific function in, in the U.S. And uh, we see that, that it spreads quickly through the agencies that deal with the FSLTT, and then uh, it spreads to the, the wider U.S. Uh, financial industry as a whole. And from May of that year, last year, and through December, we see a, uh, you know, it starts getting well beyond the financial industry and starts infecting other verticals as well, with some evidence that the attacker groups were targeting other, other verticals with, uh, with these kind of crafted mal spam email messages. Um, the authors also uh, are, we see from on that period, um, they've kind of done this dry run in the in the the German and Austrian and the Swiss banking industries, and they've got a pretty good, pretty effective tool that's very virulent and spreads very easily. And um, they've added polymorphism to make it harder. They've added some other features to make it harder for to combat. And then they start adding uh, functionality to it. So now we start seeing um, a real emphasis on the command and control piece being added. So where these these infected machines in these in the environments um, now they're being infected, and uh, whereas before they were just kind of reporting out their their harvester credentials, um, now we see that that they are turning into in effect bots or zombie systems that are waiting for other commands from from a central server, and uh, they the attack group starts adding things like uh, like more advanced credential stealers, so it's targeting different browsers. And then also um, some email scrapers that that are uh, more effective to to target kind of email lists that then the malware can utilize to uh, to send more mal spam out to additional victims. Um, this hit home for our team really in last fall. We started seeing a number of non-financial verticals being affected. Um, in particular, we started seeing a lot of infections in the healthcare. Uh, industries and a lot of hospitals were getting hit with this. Uh, I I remember very vividly that um, the day before Thanksgiving, we got a call from a, a pretty major hospital in the U.S. that was not a client, um, and they they were uh, kind of at their wits' end. They had tried a number of other companies to help come in and help them, and this uh, Emotet variant was spreading just just like wildfire throughout their environment. And they had. Um, patients that were, were they were on systems to help with with uh, monitoring and life support things like that that were Windows based that were that the systems were locking up um, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, but basically uh, the, they were effectively being shut down by this infection so it was so effective and it spread that it was uh, it was kind of denial of servicing the hospital. And uh, so I, I remember our team mobilizing um, on Thanksgiving and, and going out and, and helping that hospital get things under control. Um, but that was just one of, of many, many instances that we saw last year. And uh, so it, it, it kind of followed that pattern throughout the year, through the end of last year. And then uh, we saw a shift in, in January of this year. So uh, due to what, what we now, you know, sitting here in November and in, in, in October uh, when, when these reports started coming out, um, there, there's stronger and stronger evidence that the Mealybug group was selling their loaders to other um, cyber criminals to effectively spread their particular brand of malware. And we started seeing lots of, of ransomware infections that were kind of, uh, you know, combined with the spreader for Emotet, and in effect, making kind of a super bug. So uh, things like TrickBot and QuackBot, which are just super virulent in and of themselves, were starting to be delivered via the, the loader for Emotet. And this was making it really, really challenging for the, these victim organizations to deal with because, uh, in effect, they were dealing with multiple persistence mechanisms. Uh, you know, I think Emotet has or so themselves, and then whatever the, the piece of, of malware that was being dropped 
um, was also you know spreading throughout the environment using its own persist or own persistence and spread, and so it became a real real big problem. Uh, and also throughout the whole thing, we saw that you know even though um, other payloads were being utilized, a lot of times the systems that were infected were still serving as kind of that that bot node for the attack group as well. So they got they got something out of it beyond just uh, getting payment or some sort of compensation for spreading the, the other malware. So let's break there and, and talk about how uh, this spreads. And this is a fantastic graphic from a recent, well, somewhat recent, I think, July US CERT article about Emotet. And this is really when, when uh, we, we saw the real uptick in that, that kind of um, the spreader being utilized by the other attack groups. Uh, U.S. CERT came out with some pretty good guidance here. So uh, the first first balloon, uh, number one up on the top, it talks about the infection, and it's um, still to this day there's there's slight modifications, but generally speaking, what they're doing is they are um, they are targeting companies or verticals um, with with crafted emails, um, and the, they recently are, are crafting them in a very specific way, which we'll touch on, but um, these are, are what we call mal spam. So it's basically uh, you get an email in your inbox and it says, hey, there's a PayPal, PayPal invoice or a past due notice or a delivery notification. We see a ton of these coming in as fake DHL delivery notifications. And somebody in the victim organization decides to click on, on that particular attachment and then they're infected with, with this, uh, this type of malware. So. Uh, they click, it downloads, downloads the, uh, the malicious attachment uh, and it executes, and then we start seeing uh, number two there, which is the persistence mechanism, start to go into effect. This is where we, uh, we, we get to, to, to the, the bottom of why Emotet is so destructive. So the way that it was, um, it was crafted by Mealybug, um, it tries to, uh, to Established persistence via injection into explorer.exe, so Windows Explorer, which everybody needs if you're running a Windows machine. Uh, it, it then copies itself to some files in some specific locations that look like system files, and then uses registry keys to further establish its uh, kind of stickiness there. Then it installs uh, as services on the system and also as scheduled tasks. So we have four different uh, different persistence mechanisms that's utilized by the Emotet um, spreader module, um, and and then we have whatever the payload is as well. So um, the spreader then um, will will kind of pause for a second, and it will look for instructions from the external command and control server, which is um, box number three there. And basically, uh, emo, it, re it reaches out its hand and says, hey, hey, bad guy, C2, I'm infected. What do you want me to do? Uh, and there's some evidence that the, the attackers can um, automate some of the responses. The usual default is you know, spread. You know, so run the, run the spread module and spread to as many places as you can using uh, S and B. Um, but there's also other things that, that they can tell it to do. So then in number four, you, you, you have the, this great graphic by US CERT, you have um, kind of the breakdown of some of the modules that uh, can be utilized by infected machines. So we have um, you know, the, the web browser password harvesting. There's the Outlook scraper so that um, your, the, the victim's contacts can be reported back to the attackers. There's a, a netpass.exe, which is a real interesting one. So that, that basically will um, look for, for stored network passwords. Um, and then there's a, a mail password harvester as well. And then there's also this um, credential enumerator, which is kind of another part of the spread module. And this will basically try and, um, try and connect to things on the local domain using those harvested credentials. And this is what causes, this particular module is what causes kind of that denial of service effect. So um, we have uh, these victim organizations that are infected and then effectively by this spreading, they, they are shut down. The systems that are, are, are listening to and responding to these requests um, are doing, doing so in such a rapid fashion that they, they can't be utilized for, for other things like doing their day-to-day -day job. 
So it, it effectively uh, shuts down the victim environments in many cases, depending on how their network's configured and domain is configured. So that's all, you know, pretty bad stuff. Uh, it, it's, it's extremely virulent. It uh, is, is kind of a strong arm in the way that it spreads, uh, can denial of service organizations. And then once things are infected, it, they become bots. So this is a, a, pretty, bad, um, a pretty bad combination. And that's, usually, that's just kind of with the traditional uh, malware, not the, the, the super bugs that are combined to do other things. So um, Emotet uh, pre pre presents some pretty unique challenges to the community. This is a, a great graphic from our friends at Bleeping Computer uh, that, that kind of graphs out where the, uh, the infections are seen most commonly. And you can see that um, that it's pretty much throughout the world on, on all the major continents with a lot of focus on North America and then some focus on uh, the EU and, and other areas over there. So um, basically the, the challenges are, are many to, to this particular type of malware. So because of the loader and delivery model and the way that the, the attack group has, has evolved, this can in effect be used to spread any other type of malware. So it's almost unlimited uh, features and characteristics of the payload. Uh, they got really good at the polymorphism piece uh, after their first test run in, in the German and Austrian banks. And so now when it, when it uh, successfully lands in an environment, it's constantly changing to evade detection. And that can, that can be a challenge to most traditional antivirus solutions. Um, it can also be updated and, and have new modules added to it after infection. So these zombies or bots that are sitting out there across the world uh, are just kind of waiting for, for f further guidance. And uh, the further guidance can include downloading additional software. So um, right now, the current estimate of latent infections or affected systems out there is, is just conservatively hundreds of thousands of machines that are, that are infected by this and, and uh, can be controlled via the C2. Many of you might have seen the recent news that uh, you know Emotet made some headlines this last month in October because it started uh, these infected systems, these hundreds of thousands of infected systems started downloading a new module in October. And that module was used instead of uh, to harvest email credentials, as one of the previous modules was, it was uh, updated to actually harvest emails themselves and my colleagues and i received uh, uh, quite a bit of interest and questions from um from other other members of the community but also uh, we received some some questions from the the media on you know why why this shift why uh, this group that that's that's been concentrating on harvesting banking passwords and you know credentials why are they starting to harvest email well, the answer is is pretty uh, is is pretty clear that so they are after money, and we've seen uh, some of you might have have joined me for a previous webinar talk on on business email compromise, which is another massive threat and is completely on the upswing. Seventy eight percent of U.S. corporations were affected this last year by uh, by business email compromise. And business email compromise, we've seen a shift towards uh, these really targeted email campaigns, uh, with, which are kind of malwareless on that side. I won't get into all the details, but uh, if they're after money, we know that business email compromise is a very effective way to eventually lead to a cash payout or wire transfer. And so uh, when we were being asked by, by all these external parties, well, why are they, tr why are they switching up their, their tactics? This is, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. When we looked at it and when we dug in a little bit, it makes total sense because they can effectively um, turn the the infected machines on the Emotet botnet into business email compromise like ATMs. Um, so it's pretty advanced. This module that came out uh, basically will will harvest emails in total and will um, put them into a file format that is usually allowed out to the .tmp file. And then it uploads those to a, a proxy server and there's a storage capability built into that. Uh, so it, uh, like everything that, that Mealybug does, it's, uh, it's, there's a, a thought behind it. 
there was some pretty uh, pretty good code behind it, and they are effectively doing this across all of their uh, their infected nodes. So I talked about this this previously, but the reason that the group is doing this is money, and we've seen that that they they can get money through their primary means, which is that that directly targeting the banking industries and harvesting credentials. Um, they can get it through other means, uh, like selling off their software, which we've seen, uh, selling it to different different other parties to to really use that loader piece to supercharge the other malware, and then they can do that. Uh, recently, that shift to what we think is is now a BEC type uh, attack, or at least being able to to uh, sell that information to a BEC actor, and uh, there it, it's. Uh, in effect, a fire and forget solution with low time investment for the attackers. They just find some publicly available email addresses. They gain access into an organization or a vertical, and then it automatically spreads in a worm-like fashion using polymorphism and gathers other credentials and then basically spreads further. So um, it's a really effective way for them to attack. And, uh, and through its automated spread, it's, it's pretty quick for, for uh, the infection piece. So the most important question in my mind is, how do you prevent against it? And that's where hopefully uh, I can provide some, some value to, to you in the audience today. So for those of you who have attended some of my previous talks, I like to uh, utilize what's called the, the cyber kill chain. And this is a, um, there was a, a paper that was produced by a colleague of mine we, uh, that we, we worked together at the DOD named uh, Dr. Rohan Amin and one of his colleagues uh, called the cyber kill chain. And what it, what it entails is basically uh, taking the traditional warfare model, so kinetic warfare using tanks and planes and guns and bombs, and basically applying that to the um, the cyber arena. And so they, in their paper, they uh, they broke down the phases of of warfare into, uh, and, and then applied it to the cyber side. And the phases are reconnaissance, development, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and then the action on on objective. You can apply. Uh, a number of these phases to most cybersecurity attacks. Um, not all of them for every attack, but generally speaking, the attackers will um, will spend some time getting to know the environment, doing reconnaissance. They'll develop, uh, which we saw here. We saw this uh, this development uh, throughout the the German and Austrian, and then the Swiss, and then the UK, and then the US. We saw these evolutions of of malware. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the other, other phases as well. So uh, when answering the question, how do we prevent this and combat this threat, I think it's a really good model to apply the cyber kill chain and figure out a few of these phases that are really applicable. So we'll start there with reconnaissance. So we know that this is a, this is a pretty organized uh, uh, and really a tough and thorough adversary, Mealybug group. Um, they do uh, they do Q and A. They do iterative design. They there's a lot of evidence that their initial vectors inbound to verticals are targeted and customized, um, basically mouse spam or malicious emails. So uh, if we want to thwart the ability of the attackers to do reconnaissance, there's a couple of really key things that you can do. Uh, the first low-hanging fruit item that I, I really uh, think is effective, if it applies to your business, is to do GOIP blocking. So I know we are in a kind of a global business mentality these days, but the, real, the, the, the reality is that not every business has to talk to every part of the world. And so if there are parts of the world that, that you don't do business with, you should block them at your perimeter. Make it so they can't even talk to you. On my BEC presentation, I talked about the fact that a lot of these attacks are, are frankly coming from, from Nigeria. And so if your organization doesn't have to talk to Nigeria via the internet, don't. And that's a really effective way to stop a lot of those, uh, that, that reconnaissance so that they can't do research on you. Um, then it's really important to also know what, what information from your company or your organization is public. 
And you can do this through um, either doing your own research uh, through open source intelligence on the clear web, or um, you can do things like, uh, like what we call Google dorking, which is basically uh, effectively turning a search engine like Google into a tool to search for you and your organization. And you can, you can give it crafted queries that return specific things. So if I wanted to return every uh, PDF uh, that, that's out there from the Acme Corporation website, I would, I would tell it site, site colon acme.com file type colon PDF. And this is a really good way for you to customize, kind of use these search engines to your advantage here. You can also hire specialists to do this as well. And Silence has a team that's dedicated to do the, doing this, and they do it really, really well, um, both in the kind of clear web and also what we call the dark web or the under web. And there's specific tools and technologies that, that are utilized to search um, you know, the clear web, but also more, more importantly, the, the dark web or the kind of uh, you know, the, the under web, which is uh, a network of computers that wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be directly accessible by the internet. So then you can know your environment and know, um, know like your, your vulnerabilities and, your, and your, your places that need improvement. This can really help um, effectively cut off an attacker from being able to gain access to your environment. Um, this is important because that's one of the places that attackers can get information to craft specific target targeting vectors inbound to your organization. If they are able to gain access to servers or systems. So you can do things like a penetration test or a red team, which effectively, if you your organization is, is a house, it basically checks the windows and the doors to see if any of them are open or openable easily. So uh, if, if the attackers can get into the organization easily. Or you can do a compromise assessment. And this is a, a, a type of assessment that uh, was really developed and pioneered here at Silence. But basically, uh, in that same model with the house, a, a pen test will tell you if the doors or windows can be used to get into the or to get into the house. A compromise assessment says, is there somebody already in my house? Is there a burglar that's that's lurking in my closet or lurking in my bathroom? And what 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 it entails is basically doing an analysis on systems throughout the environment to see if there are any indicators of compromise. So if any of those systems have been, been compromised or have, you know, are currently compromised, um, it will tell you that. And then also very important on, on kind of forward in the reconnaissance is, is practicing uh, proper uh, account maintenance. So many times the, these attack groups will utilize publicly available accounts uh, out there to try and and gain um, access into the environment. So um, if you, through your reconnaissance, you find that our accounts uh, are, are out there, then uh, they warrant maybe some additional security measures. Um, but also it's important to shut down accounts and, and deactivate them that, uh, for the accounts that are not currently in use. This will stop the attackers from being able to, uh, to utilize stuff that's already out on the internet. So then uh, thwarting delivery. I think everybody that joined probably uh, it, it, that's familiar with Silence probably knows the, about Silence Protect. I talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, you know it's 99.7% effective uh, at at stopping cyber threats. And traditional AV, and the reason that that Emotet is really tough for traditional AV is because so um, the, the the traditional AV, like um, you know the uh, you name it out there the, these days, but they basically will do a signature-based analysis and protection scheme. So this means that somebody in the install base somewhere has to have seen a threat so that they can generate a signature and then protect the rest of the install base. And protect is a little bit different. So protect uses, it, it, it basically uh, breaks down executables and, and other file formats into their component pieces and then uh, our, our team has fed millions and millions of, of malicious files into this AI engine, machine learning engine, and millions and millions of legitimate files. And we've, we've basically instructed the machine learning uh, engine to, to, to detect what makes a bad file bad, what makes a good file good. And then before something's executed on a system with you know, in millions of seconds, whatever uh, CPU time, 
it will uh, the protect will check and see if it has components that that are in a specific configuration that would indicate that the file may be malicious, and it will then block that. So Emotet is a polymorphic threat. It comes on an, onto a network, and then it, it changes itself to make it so that it's really hard to detect. And so traditional antivirus, having not seen a signature that's that's this unique, will not be able to to block it. And uh, and we've seen this time and time again with Emotet, where the traditional antivirus, uh, uh, the the people that utilize that as a solution are greatly affected by this and can't stop it. But if you utilize something like Silence Protect, which is that AI-driven, machine learning-driven solution, it will see anything that, that Emotet kind of morphs into, it says, oh, that's bad, block it. Then tries to morph again, it says, that's bad too, block it. Um, so it's very effective there. It's uh, another thing that, that you and the organization can do to stop the spread uh, is to restrict SMB traffic between hosts. And this can be done via a GPO. Um, through through Microsoft, you basically, uh, if you don't need to to utilize SMB to do file transfers or or um, you know other other you have other legacy software relying on it, then you can restrict that or just you know basically uh, effectively neuter it. And this makes it so that that Emotet can't spread in the environment. Um, it's really important to have you know malicious mail filters, so mouse spam filters at the uh, at the gateway in your environment. That will also block a lot of, of the Emotet emails coming in with these attachments. Um, additionally, on the, in this kind of the same same vein, if you block uh, attachments, certain types of attachments, so attachments that are you know, EXEs, other things, uh, things that shouldn't be coming through in the email, then that, that could be effective. What they're doing uh, with Emotet is they're uh, embedding things inside of a, another file, so um, it sometimes can get through that, but it's still a really effective and just a prudent step to do. And then um, one of the things that I always advocate for, and, and I, I was weighing putting this in or leaving it out, but um, I think it's important to mention multi-factor authentication. So most of you out there know what it is, but basically it's uh, it's adding something so traditional single factor authentication is usually a login and a password so it's something that you know uh, multi-factor adds another dimension so it's usually something that you have so like a cell phone um, getting a text each time you log into your your email solution or or anything like that um, basically will will add another step uh, that that really cuts off a lot of different types of attacks for Emotet, it could be very important because um, it, it, it could alert the user that something's off. So if uh, if multi-factor is is turned on and they go to you know click on something and they're presented with with a certain type of login or something, then they know that that that, that something's off. But it also makes it so that the attackers, if they gain uh, credentials, they can't get into the environment and and use those credentials to do a further cyber attack, which we've seen happen in a lot of cases as well. So then another piece to the, uh, the cyber kill chain is command and control. And we know from, uh, from the talk earlier that, that Emotet uh, relies on a command and control or C2 node to effectively um, you know, carry out a lot of the commands and, and kind of the, the infrastructure for the, the attack. So uh, in order to stop that, um, you know, the, that AV piece is really important because once it's in C2 mode, a lot of times um, you know it'll it'll be kind of latent on the system, and that a, that antivirus solution can um, can detect that and shut that down. It's also really important to practice strong patch management. So take away the ability for um, some of these communications to happen and some of these spread to happen. Um, that could be very useful when combating this in this phase two. And then it's really important as well to um, to block the known C2 IOCs, so the the IP addresses um, and other IOCs at the perimeter of your environment. Uh, if they are trying to to reach into the environment and and manipulate the systems that are infected, but they can't basically talk to the environment. It's kind of similar to that GOIP blocking we mentioned earlier, um, where the, it just effectively cuts it off and makes it so that they can't can't operate. So quick, uh, quick coffee sip, and then we'll be on to the next slide. Ah, there we go. 
All right. So the last thing we can talk about is is thwarting malicious actions. So um, once a environment an environment is infected, um, there are certain steps that you can take to uh, to combat that infection. And as I mentioned, kind of in the opening of the presentation, the average price per incident for medium to large businesses to combat Emotet is a million dollars, over a million dollars. So this is something where, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the average organization uh, cost, but you can take steps to, um, to make it so that you can effectively combat this and, and to really reduce that cost for your, your, in your organization. So one of the things that's important is to have an incident response plan. And um, basically, an incident response plan will effectively uh, walk your organization through who does what during a cyber incident. So <clears throat> basically, um, it, it's, it's important to not be in a situation where you, you have a cyber incident and for the first time, you are drilling and practicing your, um, you know, your plan to combat that. So it, it helps to establish roles, to familiarize people with what to do during an incident, and then to um, basically make it so that when you have an incident, that response is that much more effective. It's important to also have a business email compromise or BEC playbook to or module uh, to that, that incident response plan. And so the overall plan is kind of like the umbrella, uh, which describes like a, what, what to do in an incident. The playbooks are specific customized scenario-based responses that are designed to talk through um, exactly uh, what to do in a specific scenario. So the bi business email compromise, we know that they're interested in that, that email harvesting and we know that they're going to be using that, either selling it to BEC actors or using it to do BEC themselves. So it's important to be prepared for that and be able to um, to effectively walk through with that in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, it's really important to train uh, users, and and this is, you know, 80% or so of the of the attacks out there, I think, are um, are caused by a user action. So that's really somewhere where if you, if you effectively train them and, and to teach them what to do and what not to do, you can effectively cut that off at the pass. So uh, one really big thing that you can train people on is kind of that, that spam training, phishing training, which uh, allows people to, to see things that are, that are maybe out of the ordinary and not click on them. And then the other thing uh, to, to remind people is to just keep their, their home stuff at home. So uh, one of the purposes of um, Emotet has been to, to compromise banking credentials. And so if, if we train the users not to bring those into work, then we don't have to worry about those being harvested. Uh, for the BEC piece, I think it's still really, really important to also have effective policies around wire transfers. So um, for your organization, it used to be that, that most organizations would accept a wire transfer request via email. The, the later guidance uh, up until this year um, was to, to do voice verification. So if somebody wants to transfer money out of your organization, have them call in and make that a requirement via policy. The even newer guidance uh, from our friends at the FBI and, and some law enforcement folks that, uh, that we have now added on, onto staff here is to use uh, FaceTime or other video methods for verification. And that really makes it almost impossible, if not impossible, for the attackers to do uh, wire transfer, that type of threat. Okay, so what do you do if you're a victim? Uh, this is, a lot of this is right from the US CERT page, so credit to them. Um, with a couple, a couple of additions and edits by, by our team. But um, the first thing to do is to follow your IR, IR plan. And we touched on that previously, but it's incredibly important to have that before the incident itself. Uh, the other thing is due to the virulence of uh, Emotet, it's a different type of response that's warranted 
than most traditional cyber infections and cybersecurity incidents. So the U.S. CERT recommends being very, very aggressive with your response. Um, basically, any machines that are, that are infected, um, shutting them down and, and taking them off the network. And the, that's to stop that spread. And then uh, they also recommend taking the network offline uh, to basically uh, investigate, to cut off that command and control inbound communications. Um, and uh, to be very cautious, and they, they say this a couple of times throughout the, their guidance, but be really cautious not to log into systems using domain or shared admin creds. And there's been numerous times on cases that we've worked with Emotet, um, even very recently, where the, the responders will initially log into systems to check them out, quote unquote, and they'll utilize domain creds to do so. And then we, we see the, the, uh, those credentials being um, exfiltrated via the C2, and then we see a different type of attack starting on, on the, in that environment. Um, we see the spread, you know, just really like somebody pours gas on a fire. Uh, we see the spread just, just uptick and, and start getting really, really rampant. Uh, so they also recommend, um, to, rather than trying to, to clean systems, to, to re-image the system. Uh, and then uh, basically to take systems that are, that are not affected and put them onto a clean uh, local area network and it, install uh, effective antivirus such as Silence Protect. Then they recommend doing uh, password resets. Once you have that kind of that, that core nucleus of clean systems, doing password resets uh, for domain and local creds. And then uh, they also recommend doing a, a, an analysis. So this is kind of a little bit contradictory here. They say, you know, just go ahead and re-image. But they're also saying to, uh, to do an investigation to figure out patient zero. And the reason that they're recommending that is because we do see uh, these hybrid attacks frequently where the attackers are utilizing um, the spread mechanism to gain access and then, then coming back with, uh, with credentials. And then they also say that uh, you should review the log files and, and, and uh, other things. So this is all very good guidance and this is gonna work in uh, the vast majority of cases. We also have another method here at Silence, and um, we've been utilizing this since Emotet started really uh, coming into prominence. Uh, basically, we can work with, with your teams if you are a victim to do kind of a combination of, of these steps, but also to deploy uh, Silence Protect to the environment and effectively kind of keep the system and the environment running but kind of cut off the ability of the uh, of, of Emotet to spread and to communicate with, with the C2 nodes. And this has been utilized by us a number of times for environments like that hospital I talked about where they couldn't take these systems down and just re-image and start over from scratch because these systems were connected to, to patients and to other, um, you know, other medical systems, medical um, you know, data gathering and analytic systems that, that they had to keep online. And so we've effectively come up with a, a kind of a, an amended uh, way to, to do this, this response that is, uh, is still time intensive just because of how virulent Emotet is, but it also allows us to, to kind of keep systems online while we're doing that response. So with that, I see we have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll open it to questions. Thank you, Sig. So we do have some questions that came in. And the first one is from the timelines described of the Motet attacks. Doesn't this appear to be nation slash state supported? It, it, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, well, there was a question, doesn't this seem to be nation state or it doesn't seem to be? Uh, doesn't this appear to be nation supported? Okay, I, I got you. Um, so it, I, that's a great question because of the way the targeting is undertaken, it makes it seem like it might be. Uh, but current thought in the community is that this is an advanced attacker group that is not necessarily tied to a, a nation state. Um, we do see that the, the targeting of 
specific banking industry. Uh, so the Germans, the Austrians, the Swiss, the UK, and then the US. Um, but we're, uh, at least um, the, the kind of consensus is that, that this isn't uh, a nation state. But there are theories out there uh, that this is a particular rogue nation that uh, would benefit from these, these credentials. But, um, but right now, um, the, the kind of greater consensus is that, that it's not. Great question. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more. So forensically speaking, is there, a, is there an available listing or database of any of their signatures throughout the OS, i.e., so if we can scan a system with our own programs, picking up on those or some of those say, hey, we're possibly infected? Yes, th there are. Um, and that's a, that's a fantastic question. So. Um, the best place for that is the uh, the U.S. CERT uh, Emotet malware uh, update. This was issued in July 20th of this year, 2018, and it is uh, TA18-201A, um, and they they go through um, some pretty good indicators of compromise there, including file names and paths and registry keys and and other things uh, with some specific uh, you know specific file names. It's important to note that 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 part of the polymorphism does allow Emotet to kind of change those names on the fly. So a lot of the the executables that that we see are these kind of uh, eight character just uh, alphanumeric strings .exe. But uh, there's some really really good info in that US cert um, that notice, and that's where I got the, the graphic for the, the kind of how it spreads. I would highly recommend everybody checking that out. Uh, it's got some good info. Thank you, Sig. Um, so a couple more questions here. It says, uh, threading delivery, the disability of office macros is a very effective way of blocking infections. Yes, uh, that is a, a great point, and I missed that on my slide, but if you're in an organization that's not going to be utilizing office macros, that's a really effective way to thwart delivery because these um, th this type of malware does utilize that as as part of its its delivery mechanism, and that's that's a really good just general note. Um, if if you're in an organization that you can turn that off, that's a that's a really good thing to turn off. Um, there are pieces and you know there's there's a different components in silence protect and one of those is that script control that that will uh will you know kind of combat that too but if you can just shut it off at the source that's a great suggestion thanks i have a couple more here is if i suspect that i have malware in my environment how do i best reach out to your team to talk about doing an uh, ir response that's a great, great question. So um, here, here's my contact info, and, and down below on proservices at silence.com, uh, uh, that's a, a good email. And then there, we also have a, a, a 24 by 7 staffed um, phone number there that people can call. If you're having an incident or you suspect you're having an incident, you can call that at any time. And we do have folks working around the world. We have a team uh, in the Western U.S., Eastern U.S., um, uh, pretty much throughout the U.S. We also have a team based in Cork, Ireland. That, that, that is our EU headquarters. We have a team in the Middle East uh, out of Dubai. And then we also have a team that's uh, based out of Tokyo. And so at, at any given time throughout the day, you can call uh, the IR hotline and you will be connected to somebody from our IR team uh, through kind of a that, that um, person who answers. They'll take some notes. Uh, about your situation and then they'll reach out and then you should receive a call back pretty quickly from somebody from our team. Okay, excellent. I have a couple more here. Um, the question is, if I suspect several machines have been infected with Emota, what should I be doing to stop it from spreading? That's, that's another great question. So um, as we saw on that, that picture of the world, there's a lot of, um, and we've seen a number of times throughout the history of Emotet where they've kind of um, shut the spread off and then just kind of left the, the botnet open and, and running. So um, uh, yeah, a really good, good thing to do would be to run um, something like Silence Protect that, that can detect any type of that polymorphic um, strain of, of Emotet and basically just uh, block it right there at, at the endpoint. Um, 
but that, that's a because it can be turned back on and spread pretty rapidly. Uh, that's definitely something that that warrants a lot of attention, just because of uh, problems that that we've had with with clients, like that hospital that I talked about, that was kind of shut down when it started spreading. And I have one more last question is, if we have just completed building out an IR plan for our company, can silence help us do some tabletop exercises? Yes, and we actually, um, so tabletops are really important and they're uh, effectively a drill for the IR plan. Um, we have a few different flavors that we can we can help your, your company with. Um, we have a, a uh, worm, module, which is uh, based on Emotet. We have a, a business email compromise module that we can use. So we can kind of pick a flavor of tabletop and then we get everybody in a room that's a stakeholder and we kind of, we just walk them through a, a simulated cyber incident with that flavor. And, um, and then we, we do an after action gap analysis creating in effect um, the response from everybody and recommending um, improvements in different areas. So it's really helpful to to drill that incident response plan before you actually have an incident through a tabletop. Thank you, Sig. This wraps up the Q&A session. And Sig, thank you so much for an informative webinar. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future. And in addition, I also want to invite everyone that our next webinar will take place on the 15th, it's going to be Hacking Exposed. And before I forget, is the recording and the PowerPoint tech will be available shortly. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.